Thank you for doing this, Abby. Oh, you're welcome. We have gone live. Welcome to the Revolution 250 podcast. I am Bob Allison, the chair of the Rev 250 Advisory Group, and our guest today is Abby Chandler, who is a professor of history at UMass Lowell, also a member of the Massachusetts 250th Commission. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Now, you've, uh, I really want, I know you've written a couple, uh, an interesting book. You're working on a book on the riotousness in the decade before the revolution. You've uh, written a couple of pieces about the um, regulators and also are writing about the Gatsby. So why don't we, uh, where should we start? Well, I suppose this, in tech, the Gatsby is 1772, but the real focus in my research is the 1760s and the imperial crisis. So that might be a good place to start. Okay. That, that, that's good because it's a, a good question. You know, how, what, and in Boston, we are kind of Boston centric, but then you look at an episode like the regulators. Um, so what causes this tension between the colonies and the mother country? One of the things about the regulator rebellion, which has really made it challenging to study, challenging to write about, is regulator rebellion is actually very much of a internal issue. But in the late 19th century, historians looked at it and thought, this is the first battle of the American Revolution. The reality is it wasn't, but that idea stuck to the point that the ongoing Outlander television series, because that particular book series looks at the Regulator Rebellion in book five, which became season five, very much portrayed it as the first battle of the American Revolution. And yet when you start to dig in to the Regulator Rebellion, what it was was a group of North Carolina colonists who were frustrated by the fact that their colonial government was deeply corrupt. And one of the interesting through lines of the Regulator Rebellion is that in its initial stages, Governor William Tryon is actually leaning towards being supportive of the regulators and their concerns about the colonial government but try on, and this is a large part of the argument that I make in the book I'm working on, winds up stuck in a rock in a hard place, as so many royal governors are, because he has the regulators who are frustrated with the royal government, or not, sorry, the colonial government, but he also has an increasingly restive colonial assembly who are definitely heading they i mean they are opposed to the stamp act they are opposed increasingly opposed to britain and tryon really has to choose which side of the regulator rebellion he's going to go with is he going to go with the regulators who are frustrated with the colonial government or is he going to go on the side of the colonial legislature and he ultimately decides to side with the colonial legislature and this, of course, leads to the Battle of Alamance, where Tryon violently and swiftly crushes the Regulator Rebellion. But Josiah Martin, who is the next right. royal governor in North Carolina, he's also the last royal governor. One of the first things he does is send a message into the North Carolina backcountry to find out about the Regulator's return and the exodus comes mm -hmm. back, Josiah Martin says, wait, the regulators have a turn, but mm -hmm. then but in North Carolina is corrupt. And the North Carolina colonial government says, well, wait a minute, this is an evidence of imperial overreach. How dare you? And a lot of the regulators right. end up as loyalists. Right. Hmm. So can you tell us something about what 
the grievances? I mean, who were the regulators and why they were upset with the North Carolina legislature? Yes. So the regulators are by and large backcountry colonists who settle in the North Carolina Piedmont in the 1740s and 1750s. They're often portrayed as landless, as the poor, but when I started digging into them, what I realized is that a lot of them are small scale land speculators. Mm-hmm. And one of their many issues with the colonial government, North Carolina is a very poor colony, and they can't afford salaries for the county clerks and the sheriffs mm-hmm. and the surveyors. So what they do is they allow those men to collect a percentage of the costs of notarizing the mm-hmm. rights or a percentage of the cost when you're collecting local taxes. But there are no rules regulating this. There's that word regulator. And if you are a small scale land speculator, this becomes a problem in a hurry. So that's one of their issues. Another of And of course from their their from their from their point of view, it's not that in order to attract people to do the deed of justice of the peace, we need to let them collect fees. They just see the fees that seem to be arbitrary and, um, and not regulated. Yeah. And so, there are, so it's. Sorry. There are no laws governing how much of a percentage you can take. Mm-hmm. Right. So, yeah, a local county registrar can take a 15% cut. Um, hmm. There's also yeah. Yeah, a lot of evidence that, particularly with taxes, that the local sheriff would come out to collect taxes and the family hmm. would quite put a note down and they're, okay, we pay taxes today. But then two weeks later, the sheriff could be out again and say, oh, you didn't pay your taxes. You have to pay your taxes. And again, there are no laws this. Yeah. Yeah. So um, some of the characters, I mean, I, I know a little bit about Edmund Fanning, who seems to be yes. someone who can make enemies wherever he goes. Is some of this a personality thing, or is there, or, or am I reading too much into the it regulator is, propaganda? Yeah, it's very much a person. All right, it's a little of both. Um, it is a personality thing. Fanning is fascinating. At one point, a couple of the regulators actually managed to take a deport on expulsion focus. And hmm. I was reading through the court records uh, for this, and my background is, of course, a legal historian. So anytime anybody's in court, mm-hmm. I find that interesting. And the ruling on the court, but it's a jury trial, and the ruling on the jury trial basically says, Fanning, yes, you are guilty of extortion, but, and sure things get a little messy because the actual amount he is charged, that court document has not survived, but there's an oral tradition that he was charged Mm. six pence for extortion which is a minuscule hmm. amount. Wow. And even then. Yeah. And so mm-hmm. it's this very interesting, yes, you're guilty, but we're only going to charge you this tiny amount. But I was in the North Carolina State Archives in mm-hmm. Raleigh, North Carolina in 2015, reading through these court records. And then I found a letter written in defense of Fanning by the man who was the Attorney General of Great Britain at that period. So as high as you hmm. can get. And yeah. I remember looking at that video. Wow. How did this happen? What's going on here? And I asked one of the archivists if they had any ideas. And the North Carolina State Archives are one of the best archives I've ever worked in. Because I came in two hmmm. days later, and the archivist said, I was thinking about that question of yours at 2 o'clock this morning. 
And it occurred to me, you might find an answer in this correspondence between Edmund Fanning and Henry McCullough. Henry McCullough hmm. is the son of another Henry McCullough, who's quite possibly the biggest landowner in North Carolina at that time. So Henry McCullough Jr. Okay. is in London at this time. He's studying to be an attorney at the Inns of Court. And he is Edmund Fanning's best friend. And the two of them are writing okay. letters. Yeah. The two of them are writing letters back and forth. And Edmund Fanning writes to Henry McCullough and says, could you do something about this problem of mine? And McCullough says, sure, let me see what I can do. And so using his connections, he gets the Attorney General of Great Britain to weigh in on this. Wow. Yeah. Wow. wow. And I just found that so interesting of yeah. just how intertwined all of these people are. Really? We're, we're talking with Abby Chandler, uh, Associate Professor of History at UMass Lowell and a scholar researching now the troubles of the 1760s and 1770s. Now, North Carolina also was very fast growing. I mean, there would be a uh, reason there are land speculators there. Can you yes. talk a little bit about, you know, what's happening there? Yeah, that's, and that, again, is what really, I think, gives birth to the regulator movement that you have massive families like the McCulloughs who are getting enormous tracts of land given to them mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. the king and they mm -hmm. then start reselling that land. The, and a lot of the, so one generation is going to be one band in North Carolina and then it goes to the West and the West and the West with every generation mm -hmm. as the McCulloughs move on to the West, what they find is there are already people living on that land who've been farming on it for the last mm -hmm. decade or so. So again, you have those tensions between the people like them and husband, probably the best known of the regulators, yeah. and Christopher Pryor and James Hunter, all of whom are settling in Orange County and Alamance County in the 1740s and 1750s. And then suddenly there's this wave of surveyors out mm. spraying their land, looking into that. And mm. so have the tensions mm. between them. And there's an issue too, isn't there, with building a governor's palace or deciding where North Carolina's capital should be, I guess is one issue. And then the governor's palace becomes yeah. an issue. That, yeah, that also factors in. So one of the interesting, North Carolina is a very poor colony, as I said earlier, and it's a colony that suffers from the fact that it's partly settled by people moving south from Virginia, and it's partly settled by people moving north from South Carolina. There isn't a first place that people really settle in North Carolina. So there isn't a clear designated capital and they start in Edenton, which is northeastern North Carolina. Then for a while, they're down in Wilmington. And when they're in Wilmington in 1764, 1765, is when William Tryon becomes governor, which is the Stamp Act crisis. And there's a massive demonstration in front of his house in Wilmington. And after things have calmed down with the Stamp Act crisis, Tryon announces he wants to get out of the Cape Fear region. And the community of New Bern offers, which is the middle of the coast. So basically, halfway between Edenton and Wilmington offers itself up as a new capital. And yes, Tryon decides that what North Carolina needs to put it on the map is this massive building that would be one half his house one half place for the legislature and he decides it has to be the grandest thing around the notes on it are fascinating because there's records detailing the orders we need this many feet of mahogany we need this many glass windows this becomes very expensive mm. again north carolina is poor so they start charging 
taxes to pay for it. And these taxes keep going up and up and up. And this goes back to those same problems the regulators are frustrated with mm. because it's the same group of county sheriffs who are collecting the taxes and not keeping track and they're allowed to gouge their percentage. Mm. It's the same group. Right. Thank you. Okay, so there are these grievances and uh, and um so what happens? I mean, it's a great story, and I, I think a lot of our listeners probably haven't heard about the regulators. And once we find out what happened, we'll get to whether or not this has something to do with the revolution. Um, I'm going to start with my bigger argument about the regulator rebellion, which is it's not the first battle of the American Revolution, and that, by the way, is something that all scholars of the last 10, 20 odd years who worked in the regulator rebellion agree on. Yeah. Where I break from that scholarship is the push in the last couple decades has been, this is a purely internal affair. Mm -hmm. This is only about North Carolina. The way I read the regulator rebellion is that it is part of the larger imperial crisis. Mm -hmm. That goes back to that point I made earlier, Tryon's caught between a rock and a hard place. He has the colonial legislature who are pressuring him to do something about the stamp craft crisis. The colonial legislature is very opposed to the regulator's issues. Mm -hmm. They're happy for the status quo, but then you have regulators who are arguing and arguing and arguing that this is an unfair system. And one of the things I noticed as I was studying the regulator rebellion is that it's a movement for two centers. There's the violent center, who are probably better known, but there's also what I think of as the civil center, or the legal mm -hmm. center, who are trying to address their grievances via traditional Anglo-American political methods. And they write petitions. Mm -hmm. And I have this article about the regulators, which was published back in 2016, looked at those petitions, right. which are very much in the English petition writing. So the idea mm -hmm. is to submit your petition and then it gets considered, can be considered by the legislature. Here again is where they bump into the hero crisis. Tryon is under pressure for the Stamp Act crisis and then the Townsend Acts. The session where the legislature, and by this point in time, they've actually managed to get a couple of the regulators into the legislature. Mm -hmm. My husband, Christopher Person, and then try and dissolve the legislature because of the town's Okay. So these grievances are not getting heard in the traditional civil political methods because Tryon is dissolving the legislature because he doesn't want to deal with the towns of us. Right. Yeah. Um, so you have a growing frustration with that, but then you, as you have a growing frustration with that, you have growing acts of violence, mm -hmm. which culminate, or, okay, it only culminates in the Battle of Alamance, but in September of 1770, the group of regulators attack the um, colonial court system, which was meeting in Hillsboro, mm -hmm. North Carolina, which in Hillsboro is the county seat for our county, which is where many of the regulators live. And that is just beyond the pale. They break up the court, they go after an banning. Mm -hmm. so we're again, and after that, things start getting really complicated. And here again is where the imperial crisis timeline matters, because by this point in time, Tryon wants to do something about the regulators. He's being considered as the governor of New York, which would be a major step up. So he needs to see like see like right. somebody who can deal with unruly colonists. But he also does not want to be seen as a royal governor who's cropping down on doing a colonist. Mm -hmm. He's not going to be bad press. Yeah. 
And the period where these decisions are being made lines up exactly with the period between the Boston Massacre and the court trials for the Boston Massacre. Right, right. So yeah, this is a very sensitive time. Yeah. And Tryon wants to do something about the regulators, but does not want to be seen as doing something with the regulators. The thing that is going for him is that the colonial legislature are angrier with the regulators than Tryon is. And he goes to them and says, hey, mm. what's the about these pesky people? Yeah. And their response is, sure. And they pass something called Johnston's Riot Act which is harsher than any riot act across the curtain at that point. Mm. Wow. Not only does it have treason charges for anybody who revolts against the government, they're retroactive. Wow. Yeah. So, and, and so we're talking with Abby Chandler from UMass Lowell about her work on the regulators, the regulator rebellion of 1770, I guess is when the Battle of Elements happened. And it's interesting because it is uh, happening at this same time, but you're showing it really isn't, you know, necessarily, it, it's not as simple as I think a superficial look might make it. You have all these different um, players here. And just in, you know, Fanning, uh, well, well, first, what happened? So Tryon does get to be governor of New York. Yes. And so, I mean, have you followed at all what happens afterwards? <laughs> And the primary reason I wound up looking into that is I presented on a panel at a conference, um, the Consortium of the Revolutionary Era Conference in February 2020, last academic conference. Wow. Um, and uh, there was another person on that panel who's working on a PhD in New York City who told me that, I'm sorry, I am thinking on his name right now. Um, there's a man who's a loyalist in New York who was very pro Tryon and also a historian, a very like Ezra Stiles, mm -hmm. recording history as, as things happen. Yeah. And he starts documenting what Tryon's doing in New York but he also writes a history of Tryon in North Carolina. Okay. And which has never been published, but the manuscript papers for that are held by the New York's uh, City Public Library. And bless them, they have put them all online. So wow. at the end of the pandemic, I was able to read those. Wow. And so because I was reading a history of Tryon's activities in north carolina that were written when he was in new york that was actually what got me there's some more reading on what Tryon is up to in new york mm. and there's a lot of similarities between trying in north carolina and trying in new york mm -hmm. he is a mi minor figure in terms of connections the person in his family with all the connections is his wife margaret mm. wake Tryon who is related by marriage to Wills Hills, the Duke of Hillsborough. Mm. And she's the one who gets try on the job in North Carolina. Okay. He's the one who gets try on the job in New York. Mm. But I really have the sense of a man who knows that he really only here because of his life connection. Yeah. And his goal is to build alliances and perfectly what he's doing in North Carolina, which is really courting the major families. Mm -hmm. So Hollis, a great example of this. And then family. Yeah. And when he arrives in New York, he starts doing much the same thing. Mm -hmm. His goal is to build connections on the ground because he knows he does not have connections with his own. And eventually of course he's gonna build up a career and do his plan yeah. with himself. Mm -hmm. But it takes him a long time to get yeah. there. Well, what about it? What about Edmund Fanning? He's uh, not originally from North Carolina. He's not originally uh, from North Carolina. He attends Yale, and actually, one of the things I noticed in the course of my research 
is he, there's, he's originally from New York State, and he has some Connecticut connections. There's actually quite a few people from Southern New England and New York who moved to North Carolina mm -hmm. in the course of the 1760s, mm -hmm. most of whom are seeking connections. But the other thing that creates these connections is there are relatively few options for a university education in the South. It's really right. an American or nothing. And so there are also North Carolina families who mm -hmm. send their children to university, usually at Yale, not at Harvard. Mm -hmm. And so my larger book looks at Rhode Island and North Carolina. And so I found a lot of connections of people traveling back and forth between Southern New England and the Long Island area, which is where I've been in this book. So yes, so, then he heads down, hmm. he becomes friends with the Nopellas, Tryon sees him as an up-and-comer, and actually mm -hmm. when Tryon leaves North Carolina, Fanning goes with him as his secretary. Okay. And so, then what, does, does he get involved with the, um, the unpleasantness after 1775 and 6? Yes. So Tryon was a soldier and officer to begin with. He will wind up fighting in the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. He eventually winds up in Prince Edward Island. And there's a Cape there, Cape Tryon, which is the equivalent of the Tryon with the White House mm -hmm. there. Wow. And Fanning basically travels with him as his secretary. So that's an alliance that will continue. Yeah. For decades. Wow, it's, it's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we're talking with Abby Chandler about her work on the regulators and on Southern New England and the, this whole troublesome decade. Um, I, I'm just curious about other things um, we could touch on. You've done a lot of work on actually teaching in the 18th century and uh, living history. I wonder if you could yes. speak a little bit about that part of your academic work. Yeah, that actually predates my academic work. Okay. I, from the age of nine, I wanted to be a living history interpreter. Really? The reason for that is I grew up in Massachusetts, and when I was in fourth grade, there was an interpreter who came from Plymouth Plantation to do a program, and he had a set of clothes for a girl and a set of clothes for a boy. I wonder if the fourth grade teacher pointed to me as the girl chosen to try on the clothing. I was a big reader of historical fiction mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. So anyway, and I remember putting them on and thinking, I want to do this when I grow up. And I did. Mm -hmm. um, I worked in the Boston uh, Harbor Islands as a park ranger one summer. This was when they were banished by the Metropolitan District Commission before mm -hmm. they became um, a national park. Right. I worked in a tiny museum called the Pioneer Village in Salem, Massachusetts. Oh, yeah. yeah. Salem in the 1630s. And I wanted to be a living history interpreter. The challenge was that it was fall of 1995. I was a senior in college. The internet barely existed and nobody knew how, how you did that. Yes. Yeah. So what I did was to take there was a copy of the american association museums directory in my college library and i went through it state by state by state by state and i wrote 25 museums letters mm -hmm. saying i'm graduating with a history major i have this experience which required and a tiny museum in western tennessee called the home place 1850 which is part of the land between the lakes, the National Recreation Area, has a apprentice program mm -hmm. where you go out. There are other apprentices in the land between the lakes. The apprentices all live in trailers in the middle of the land between the lakes, which is this enormous nature reserve. Mm -hmm. And the bottom part of this nature reserve is a tiny museum that shows what life was like in Tennessee in the 1850s. Wow. Yeah. So I moved 
to oh. Tennessee the spring of 1996. Wow. And it was a year-long job, and it, it was an amazing experience. Really? It was designed to teach would-be living history interpreters the skills. So I knew how to cook on a hearth in the Pioneer Village. I learned how to cook in a wood stove. I learned how to spit. I learned how to wow. eat. I learned how to wow. duck. In short, all of the skills that you would need. Yeah. And I went from there onto Living History Farms in Iowa. I then worked at Historic St. Mary's City in Maryland, Maryland in the 17th century. And I went to grad school at UMass Amherst in public history. The plan was I wanted to go back into the museum field, but I got interested in my dissertation topic, hmm. looking at sexual misconduct files in Florida, New England. Yeah. I got a PhD. Halfway through that, I decided that I wanted to be a professor. Okay. So here I am. But I remain a living history interpreter in the classroom, and I do a lot of teaching with objects. Mm -hmm. And I find this particularly helpful in the US 1877 survey because that's a gen ed class. I might have one, two history majors. Most of these are students who are there because they have to, who do not want to be there. And I've mm -hmm. noticed that bringing in objects and having them analyze right. them gets them excited about history. Right. It's a great story. And, yeah. and, and so they respond well to this. Now, you've also done, done a book about teaching Equiano, who's a captive. I there. contributed a chapter to a book. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And that, oh yeah, um, one of my interests is captivity narratives, yes. which are traditionally people who are taken captive by Native Americans' mm -hmm. experiences. Mm -hmm. I actually teach an entire class on teaching captivity narratives, particularly focused on narratives from Northern New England. Mm -hmm. But I was teaching excerpts from Oledo Fiano in that same U.S. to 1877 class, and one of the things I noticed about it was that it had a lot of the same narrative patterns as Mary Rowlandson. Right. I am captured, I suffer, I am released to alter my faith in God. Yes. So that led to that particular um, book chapter. And that came about because when I was in graduate school, I was grading AP US history exams. And sitting at breakfast with me one day was the wife of the man who edited the collection on teaching Oledo Afriano. Okay. And she mentioned that her husband was putting that collection together. I mentioned I had an interesting way of teaching ah. Afriano. Oh, great. And lo and behold, great. that came about. You never know these chance encounters. I mean, the yeah. interpreter from Plymouth, uh, the wife of the editor. It, it, it's really a kind of providence, I guess, is what has yeah. led you here. But yeah, um, this something I tell my students is go to conferences, talk to people. This is probably going to be important. Yeah. You never know where it will lead. So yeah. just briefly, I'd like to get back then to yes. the regulators and if um so this by the way in 1908 the u.s congress designated the battle of point pleasant then virginia as the first battle of the american revolution i didn't know if you were aware of that but, no. yeah. but it's interesting we're looking for the origin and we keep finding it in the not finding it in these places so what then is the significance of the regulators if it's not the first battle of the American Revolution? So I very deliberately am writing a book about the 1760s, as I mentioned. Yes. I, also I don't want you to give away the book. But. Yeah, no, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, to quote one of my favorite websites with books at period building, in films, there are no spoilers in history. Um, so the book looks at the Stamp Act crisis, particularly in Rhode Island, and then the Regulator Rebellion. There is a connection mm -hmm. between those two, which I can explain. Mm 
um, it's not as completely random as it might sound. But the book is particularly about the 1760s as a decade which I think needs to be considered independent of the American Revolution. Because mm -hmm. one of the things I find fascinating about the imperial crisis, which is those growing tensions across the British Empire post 1763, post the end of the Seven Years' War. And a large part of why I find the imperial crisis so fascinating is that for the 13 colonies, the imperial crisis ends with the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. But the imperial crisis does not end in the American Revolution for a lot of people from Britain all over the globe. And so, right. yeah, mm -hmm. a lot of what I find interesting about the regulated rebellion is I think it is made worse by the tensions of the imperial crisis. I genuinely believe that it would not have gotten as large as it did without the imperial crisis going. Right. Alan, at the same time, North Carolina has a long history of internal protest movements. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they have Culpeper, they have the Perry Rebellion, they have mm -hmm. the Sugar Creek Wars, they have the Enfield Riots, mm. but none of those ever really go anywhere. The Regulator Rebellion, I genuinely believe, is fed by the broader imperial crisis. Mm. Try to caught between that rock and a hard Right, place. right. Okay, well, thank you. We've been talking with Abby Chandler. We'll have to have you back on to talk about Rhode Island and connecting these two places as you're continuing to work through. So really, thank you for joining us. It's been a fascinating discussion of all of these topics. And I want to thank Jonathan Lane, our producer, the man behind the curtain, and also thank our many partners in Revolution 250. You know, we're a consortium of now of about 70 groups in and around Massachusetts looking at ways to commemorate the revolution. And I know you now are on the State Commission, which is yes. doing much the same thing. And I thank our listeners. Well, initially we thought we'd have a handful of folks in and around Boston, but we have regular listeners in Dublin and Edinburgh, speaking of the empire, as well as Sao Paulo, Brazil, uh, Jasper, Georgia, Guam and all kinds of places in between. I want to thank everyone for joining us. And I want to thank again, Abby Chandler. And now Jonathan will help pipe us out on the road to Boston. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Abby. Thank you for having me.